be myself, and I've got a really silly laugh, and I'm not going to share it with you right this moment. Um, I do want to welcome our first speaker, Clay Roberts, who visited Tacoma two years ago as the keynote speaker at the museum's Power of Play lunch. Since then, Clay has been watching what we're doing here and has taken an interest in our community's dialogue with children at the center of the conversation. Clay's impressive bio is in your program, so please help me welcome him now to the stage. Clay Roberts. Okay, good. Thank you, David. Um, that's one of those introductions that you wish your mom and dad were here to appreciate, <laughs> and they're never here at the right time. It's really nice to be back in Tacoma, and I know I'm supposed to say that, but it is really nice to be here. I started my teaching career out at Jason Lee, so, and, I, and I don't live in this community Fantastic. anymore, but, but I feel connected to this community. My sister uh, raised a family here. I have nieces and nephews in the Tacoma Public Schools. And I really am intrigued by what's going on in the city of Tacoma with young children. So when Tanya asked me to come back, I said yes immediately. Um, you have my bio in your packet, but you know, the bio doesn't tell you the most important things. So let me introduce myself, and I want to do it through my grandchildren. See, I think uh, today is about our kids and our grandkids and, the, and, and young people in this community. And, and um, grandparenting may be one of the few things in life that is not overrated. It is better than I thought it was going to be. My grandchildren call me Poppy. They, they, uh, um, and, and their observations on the world, as you just saw, are just amazing. Uh, my my five-year-old grandson, uh, a, a year or so ago, we were getting him ready for preschool, and he says, Poppy, I think underwear is like a vest for your bottom. <laughs> and I said, well, how does that work? And he said, well, underwear doesn't have sleeves, and a vest doesn't have sleeves. So I think underwear is like a vest for your bottom. <laughs> I mean, he's brilliant. So let me just, I want to share with you, because most of us are here because of the young people in our lives. Um, this is my grandson, Alex, the big guy there, and Dylan, the little guy. Um, Alex wants to be an inventor. He has got an amazing sense of, of how to solve problems. Um, we are building a tree house together right now. This tree house he designed, it has, it has a, um, a drawbridge, it has a trap door, it has a slide to exit, it has a rope swing, it has up higher in the tree, it has a crow's nest with a surgical tubing slingshot that can fire things out to the water, and he's developed a pulley and a rope to pull the, the ammunition up so he can get it back up to the, to the crow's nest. I said, Alex, where do you come up with these ideas? And he said, well, Poppy, he said, when I, when I hear a problem, I just try and think about solutions. I said, what are you thinking about right now? He said, what are we going to do about Venice with the water rising? I said, when do you think about this? He said, mostly at school. <laughs> okay? So that's Alex. Dylan, the little guy here, um, Dylan has this wonderful heart. He really loves his 91-year-old great-grandma and helps her around when she can't get around on her own. Uh, at four, he had all the bridges in, in Portland memorized. He could tell you whether they were a drawbridge or a suspension bridge. At five, he knew all the states in the United States, and he could draw a map freehand of those states. At six, he's into presidents right now. He can tell you every president in order, and he can tell you things about those presidents. He told my wife, he said, Grandma, if you were James Madison, uh, if you were an inch taller, you would be taller than James Madison. I said, Dylan, who's the tallest president in the United States? He said, Abraham Lincoln. And I said, who was the second tallest? He said, Lyndon Baines Johnson. <laughs> he has a mind like a steel trap. He just got a guinea pig. And I said, Dylan, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I want to be a rodent farmer in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's my granddaughter, Remy, who is, she, she doesn't let anything get past her. And, and she has a vocabulary that's absolutely incredible. Um, they just had a babysitter last week, and I said, how was it? And she said, it was really good, Poppy. I, it was overwhelming. <laughs> She's four, right? It was overwhelming, all right? And then our newest addition, who we're just kind of trying to get to know, um, his name is Avon Clay Fornese. 
He is the smiliest, easiest baby I have ever seen. I don't know what he's going to be like yet. We're kind of getting to know him. But he's an amazing kid. Now, I could have started out this morning by telling you what was wrong with my grandchildren. I can tell you that Alex is a little obsessive and compulsive about things. I can tell you that Dylan has some executive functioning issues which are going to challenge some teacher this year. I could tell you that Aunt Remy has a temper. As my, as my Cajun, my little old Cajun uh, grandmother would say, that girl can pitch a boogie. Okay? I could tell you what was wrong with my children instead, my grandchildren. Instead, I chose to tell you what was right with them. And here's the first lesson this morning, and you all know this. You will do more to shape and change children's behavior by focusing on what's right with them, not what's wrong with them. Okay? It's about building from their strengths, not their deficits. All right? So in that spirit, here's what I want you to do really quickly. There's a wonderful book called The Wisdom of Crowds. John Selawicki is the author. And what he says, in a crowd this large and this diverse, the crowd is a whole lot smarter than the guy up front. There's a whole lot more wisdom in this room than I possess. My job this morning is to tap the collective wisdom of this room. And so in that spirit, here's what I want you to do. For just a moment, I want you to find somebody in this room who you don't know. Part of the value in coming to a session like this is you get to know people and, and you get to understand who some of your teammates are here in Tacoma, all right? So here's how we're going to do this. When I say go, you get up out of your chair and you do this really quickly. This means I don't have a partner. When you see somebody waving back at you who is very, very different than you are and you don't know them, that's your partner. And what I want you to do, when you pair up with this partner, I want you to take, you have, you have four minutes to do this, so you need to be really on task, all right? I want you to talk, you have one minute to find a partner, three minutes to talk. I want you to talk about a young person in your life that you love and care about. And there are two rules here. It's okay to brag. I did. <laughs> and little things do count. I want you to talk about a young person in your life that you love and care about. And, and um, you don't need any more instruction. Out of your chair, find a partner really quickly. And I want you to talk about somebody you love and care about, a little guy. Thank you for doing this. Uh, good energy in the room, and my job is not to screw that up. Now, um, here's what I'd like you to do. When you go home this evening, I want you to tell whoever you talked about, whether it's through a text or if you're in your home or they're a neighbor kid, I want you to tell them, I was at a meeting today and we were talking about children, and I talked about you, and here's what I said. It's really important that we tell them. You know, we're, many of us are so invested in our children and we're trying to get them to be all that they can be that sometimes we forget to acknowledge what's really good and great about them right now, okay? So I want you to do that. Now, um, I said there are two shifts in thinking that I want, to, want you to think about this morning. Um, the first is it's about focusing on what's right, not what's wrong. Here's what we do in America. We look at the kids who don't make it. We look at children who drop out early. We look at kids who use drugs. We look at young people who are violent, and we ask, what went wrong, and how can we fix them? And it drives me crazy. You know, what went wrong, most of it is beyond our control. I think there's another way of doing this. We need to look at the kids who make it, and we need to ask, what went right? And how do you make that happen more consistently, more often for all children? That's the way we should be doing this. And there's a third group of young people who are the most interesting to look at. They are the children who come from adversity and make it in spite of that adversity. How many of you know one of those incredibly resilient kids? Yeah. I think this morning we ought to just think for a moment about those incredibly resilient children. And I think you know this, but you have nine-year-olds in Tacoma who are the most responsible members of their family. They're the kids who get their younger brothers and sisters up and get them ready for school each day. They're the kids who make sure their brothers and sisters have done their homework, they've had something to eat. They get them off to school, and they show up reasonably well prepared. They are the children who are the most interesting to look at. We have a profile of three and a half million children, and within that three and a half million, there's a subset of kids, these incredibly resilient children. I want to talk a little bit about those kids this morning. But the first thing I can tell you, it's about focusing on what's right. The second is, there's a tendency in our communities Whenever there's a problem, we, we design programs. 
I'm a program designer and developer. We've developed five national model programs, drug abuse prevention, violence prevention, you know? And I went out and looked at those programs in action, and here's what we found. Thousands of school districts had purchased our programs. And the, what I can tell you, after year one, very few were actually using them, which was disappointing. And the second thing I found is teachers would say, come into the classroom, we're using your program, and you'd walk into their classroom and you'd watch what they were doing. And what they were doing didn't look like what we had written. There wasn't a lot of fidelity between what we actually wrote for children and what actually happened, which was disappointing. But where we saw things that really touched the lives of children, that really made a difference, it had very little to do with our program. It had everything to do with who delivered our program. I think we have lost sight about what really makes a difference in the lives of children. It's not just programs, it's people. It's the people in this room that make a difference for children every day. Yeah, you can give yourselves a round of applause for that. And the reason, when, when Tanya asked me if I would be willing to do this, the reason I said yes is I happen to believe that Tanya and the staff at the Children's Museum are doing a lot more than creating programs and an environment for children in this community. I think they're trying to create a movement a movement in Tacoma. Wouldn't it be interesting if Tacoma were known as the best place in the state of Washington, and maybe in the Northwest, and maybe in the United States, to raise children and for families to live? Wouldn't that be an interesting thing? And wouldn't it be, and I, and I want to tell you, I think you, the reason I said yes is because I want to be part of that movement. I think there's some really interesting things happening here in Tacoma. And, and what I can tell you is the difference. I think there's a lot of good work going on here in Tacoma, but there's a difference between good and great. And the difference between good and great is measured in millimeters, not miles. I don't think there are huge shifts that need to take place in Tacoma. I think it's about becoming a little more deliberate and intentional in this work. And I do think it's about little shifts in our behavior. And little shifts done by a lot of people make a huge difference in a community, all right? So today, I want to talk about how do you move from good to great? And how do you create a movement in this community? And what should that movement be focused on? Now, at your tables, in those little boxes in front of you, you have a handout uh, entitled 40 Developmental Assets. It's stapled together. And make sure everybody at your, at, your, at your table has these. How many of you know this list? How many of you were here a couple years ago when we talked about this? Some of you were, most of you not. So let me just get, do a quick review. I work with a group called Search Institute out of Minneapolis, Minnesota that has been looking at healthy, successful children for over 25 years. They've been trying to figure out what young people need in order to succeed. They call those things developmental assets. I don't like the term, it sounds like psychobabble. I want you to think of these as the fundamental building blocks that children need. Look at this list, look at number three on this list. Children who have three or more adults in their life, in addition to their parents who spend time with them, who encourage them, and who call them on things when they're doing things that are inappropriate, those children do better. How many of you believe that? They do better academically, they become better citizens. It makes a difference. Look at number nine on this list. Children who spend an hour a week in community service, giving back to the communities in which they live. They're not just takers, they're givers. Those children are much less likely to be involved in gang activity. How many of you believe that? They also do better academically, by the way. Or look at 11, 12, and 13. Children who have boundaries, family boundaries, and school boundaries, and community boundaries, are really important in the healthy development of children. You can help me out for a moment. How many of you, as a kid growing up, knew where the line was? <coughs> How many knew when you crossed it? How many knew what would happen when you crossed it? It's not clear. I see a lot of parents today who are unable or unwilling to set limits and boundaries for their children. You're not doing them a favor when you do that, okay? Or look at 16 on this list. Children who have somebody in their life who expects a lot from them, an adult, do dramatically better. Help me out again. How many of you as a kid growing up had some adult who expected a lot from you? How many of you tried to meet those expectations? How many of you are still trying to meet those expectations? <laughs> Seriously, how many of you do things the way you do them? Because even if those people were dead and gone and no longer in our life, if they could see us doing our work, and maybe they can, we would want them to be proud of the way we do our work. Anybody believe that one? Yeah, I love this list. You know why? There's a lot of rhetoric around the fact that it takes a village to raise a child, and I do believe it takes a village. But no one talks about what the village needs to look like. 
for the first time on one sheet of paper, each of the items research-based. This is a picture of what the village of Tacoma needs to look like if we were serious about raising healthy, successful children. Is this just making sense? How many of you are parents in this room? Anybody going down this list right now and mentally checking off what your own children would say they have in their life? I, this is not my work. I came across this research, and we have two daughters, and they were teenagers at the time when I first saw this. So I, I brought this home, and I gave them each a copy at the dinner table, and I asked them to check off how many of these they thought we had in our family. If you're thinking about doing this this evening, I just want to prepare you. <laughs> my girls did not answer it correctly, okay? I tried to point out some of the things they missed, and it didn't go really well until I stopped being defensive and I just started listening. And when I started listening, here's what I learned. My daughter's perception was their reality. It didn't matter whether I agreed with them. If they thought we were doing a poor job of it, and I thought we were doing a great job of it, it was an opportunity to talk, all right? Now, this is the list they should have sent us home from the hospital with. And when I was there for three births of our four grandchildren, and I brought copies, and I handed it out to parents and grandparents <laughs> at the hospital. My daughters looked at me like, Dad, are you still on the clock? And I said, you know, this is the perfect time, okay? So here's, here's what I want you to think about. I love this list, uh, but a couple things I want to point out on the list. The first is the list is not complete. Everything that a child needs is not on this list. It's a great starting point, but let me point out some of the things that are missing. There's nothing about grit and perseverance on this list. Do you know what grit is? <laughs> it's, it's the ability, yes, I know you. It's the ability to deal with crap in your life. Do you know what crap is? <laughs> Criticism, rejection, asses, and pressure. <laughs> All of us and our children are going to have to deal with crap. But some of our children have to deal with crap on top of crap. Let me just, let me give you that one, okay? It's crime, racism, addiction, abuse, abandonment, and poverty. For children, it's really important that, that we help them deal with crap and teach them how to be a little more, have a little more grit and perseverance in their life. What else is missing from this list? Somebody, I, I was meeting with a group of high school students and asked them what's missing from the list and they said, one of the young men in the audience said, pets. And I said, why is that important? He said, well, my dog loves me no matter what I do. So this morning is really about becoming the person that your dog thinks you are, <laughs> okay? What else is missing from this list? There's nothing about physical health on this list. We were talking this morning about nutrition. You know. Exercise, nutrition, sleep are really important in the healthy development of children. So the first thing I tell you is the list is not complete. The second thing I want you to know, I love this list, but it's not just for children. I asked a group of high school students, why do you think some adults build these assets in your life and some don't? And, and the kids got it right away. <laughs> one of the kids said, I think the adults who don't do this, they don't do it because no one ever did it for them as a kid growing up and they don't know how. Another kid said, it's hard to fill us up if you're not full. So we came up with a new strategy that morning. Our strategy was feed the adults so they don't eat the kids. <laughs> if you're here in this room, if you want to make Tacoma a better place for children, you need to spend more time building assets for adults because it's hard to give children something that you don't possess. Okay? It's about all of us. By the way, is this a list of what children need? I think it's a list of what human beings need. Help me out here for a second. How many of you still need love and support in your life? Good, about half of you. <laughs> I don't know who recruited the audience this morning, but how many of you still need positive role models that you can look up to and believe in in these tough times that face our nation ahead? Remember that when you go to the polls. This is not a list of what children need. This is a list of what human beings need. Okay? The third is do not confuse developmental assets and economic assets. They're not the same. You know, don't assume because children come from poverty that they have low levels of assets, and do not assume because children have, their families have money that they have high levels, okay? So, it's not just for kids. It's, it's, it's not linked necessarily to economics. Um, and, and someone said recently, define asset builder for me, and, and here's my definition. If you breathe, you're on the team. 
If you breathe, you're on the team. Anybody can do this work. And you know the group that we tend to leave out the most? Our senior citizens and our children who have wonderful things to contribute and we put them on the sideline. Who's the most powerful messenger if you're trying to reach a sixth grader? It's a seventh or eighth grader. They model about two years up in their behavior, all right? So don't leave our children on the sidelines. It's really important that they're involved in this. Now, let me just, uh, I want to take one of these assets for just a moment and, and try and kind of illustrate how we do this. And I thought about this. Um, I, I was going to pick 35, which is resistance skills. Part of my teaching career in Tacoma schools, I taught at Raymond Hall for a while. Um, and, and I found that my kids, they, they weren't bad kids. They just didn't know. When I asked them why some of them were there. Did they know what they did was wrong? Of course they knew what they, they were doing was wrong. But when I asked them, they said, well, other kids asked me to do it, and I didn't know how to say no, and I went along with them, and I got busted, and that's why I'm here. They made some bad choices, okay? So, but, but I found that society, what we do with, with children is we tell them what to do. There was a whole campaign that told children, just say no. Saying to a child, just say no, is like saying to someone who's clinically depressed, just have a nice day. What's the, what's the question in the kid's mind? How? And you don't empower children by telling them what to do. You empower children by showing them how, all right? So I thought we'd take asset 39. I think one of the strengths of the Children's Museum and this movement is helping children find their spark, okay? I think it's about helping children find their spark. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say spark? Yeah. And, and somebody said recently, how do you help children find their spark? And my suggestion is find yours. The most powerful way of teaching children is to model. If you want them to be respectful, model it. If you want them to be hardworking, model it. If you want them to have compassion, model it. If you want them to pursue their spark, pursue yours, all right? And think about the people. How many of you can think of, how many of you know your spark in this room? Yeah. And how many of you know who nurtured that spark? When you were growing up, can you think about people who nurtured that spark? You know. One of my sparks happens to be learning, and another happens to be um, social, social issues. And, and I still remember in seventh grade, my seventh grade social studies teacher, Mrs. McClellan, took me aside one day outside of class, no other kids around, and she said, I've seen your IQ test scores. You're really bright, but you're not working up to your potential. She said, I'm going to expect more of you than I expect of other kids this year. She said, together, you and I are going to a higher level. I worked incredibly hard for her. And I remember she had a John Kennedy sticker on her car. And, and it, was, it was the election time. And, and she was so passionate about this that she got me. But, but about, I worked really hard for her that year. And about two years later, it occurred to me, we never took IQ tests. <laughs> I, I, have, I have four siblings. We all went to the same schools. None of us ever remember taking an IQ test. And to this day, I'm still wondering, how many kids did she take outside her classroom and tell them the same thing she told me? I still remember walking back into the classroom, feeling sorry for the poor, dumb kids in my class, because I was so smart, all right? So here's what I want you to do. Really quickly, one more time, I want you to talk about somebody who nurtured your spark growing up. And if you can't think of anybody, and that's OK, not everybody had somebody who nurtured your spark. If you can't think of anybody, I want you to talk about what you would have liked an adult to do that might have been helpful in encouraging you to pursue that spark. Everybody got it? And here's what I want you to do. One more time, I want you to find somebody in this room who you don't know. You know how to do that now. You just wave your hand. When you see somebody waving you don't know, grab them as a partner. You have three minutes to do this. Ready? Go. Out of your chair. Find somebody. Talk about nurturing your spark. Go. Thank you for doing this. Um, it's, it's funny to watch from up here because the decibel level in the room goes up. People get more animated when they talk about the things that are really important in their life. Um, I know you know your spark, and I think our job is to help children find their spark. And here's why this becomes all so important. When we become an asset building community, when we're really deliberate and intentionally about building, intentional about building these assets, and we help children find their spark, things change dramatically. Um, Search Institute has surveyed more than three and a half million kids. They, the average kid in America has 20 of these 40 assets in their life. And you might wonder, what difference does that make? If you look at my screen and you look at 
um, the light blue bars, which are illicit drug use, here's what I can tell you. Kids who have no more than 10 of these, zero to 10, 42% of them are engaged in illicit drug use. These are sixth graders through 12th graders, all right? But children who have just 10 more, between 11 and 20 assets, drug use drops from 42% to 18%. And those who have 21 to 30, it drops again from 18 to 6%. And those that have over 30 of these, only 1% are engaged in illicit drug use. Why do we need to build these assets in the, in the lives of our children? Because by doing this work deliberately and intentionally, we dramatically decrease high-risk behavior on the part of children in our community. But you know what? That's not the most important reason to do this. If you look at this second set of bar graphs, things like success in school, maintaining good health, valuing diversity, as assets increase in our children, all of the thriving indicators dramatically increase. It's a twofer when you build assets for children. You get two things, higher levels of thriving, lower levels of high-risk behavior, and children who find their spark early do better, and half of our children by the age of 12 know their spark. Our job is to help them find their spark. You know, oftentimes at, at meetings like this, we encourage folks to, to talk about their organization and how you're gonna do this, or to talk about you know, more money needed in our community, and yes, those are, are needed, but I think it starts with each of us. The movement starts with you. And let me just share with you, one of the reasons I, I, I'm passionate about doing this is the model changed me, and I, and I appreciated David's comments this morning. I'm a volunteer in my own community. I live on Bainbridge Island. I, uh, a few years ago, I was doing a presentation, and I, and I was talking to a group of parents, and I asked them, do you know every kid in your neighborhood? Do you know them by name? Do you stop and talk with them when you see them on the street? Do you know what they're good at? That's what I asked these parents, and I, I went home that evening feeling pretty good because the presentation went well. And I, I'm driving in my, into my driveway, and my headlights scan across the house next door. That was my moment of truth, because I'd asked everybody that evening, do you know every kid in your neighborhood? Do you know what the answer for me was? No. We had a new family that moved in next door that year. They have two boys. I'd met their older boy, Drew. I hadn't met the younger boy, Brian, and I thought to myself, what a hypocrite. So I made a mental note. That week, I'm out in my yard, and, and they have a dog and we have a dog and our dogs are getting to know each other through the fence. I won't give you all the details, okay? <laughs> but, but they were running up and down this fence line and, and I was laughing at my dog and I look over and here's Brian who's 13, who's the young man I haven't met and he's laughing at his dog and I'm thinking this is the perfect timing and I walked over and I introduced myself. We talked for just a second. He said, I gotta go because I gotta mow the lawn. They've just moved in. Their lawn is heavy and thick. He's got a new push mower. It's a power mower but it, he cranks it up, it goes about 10 feet and it dies because it's all clogged up with wet grass and he turns it over and cleans it out and he cranks it again and another 10 feet and it dies. He's gonna be at this all morning. And then I realized I could help him out because we have a riding lawnmower. So I, I said, hey Brian, if you uh, help me get the grass catcher off this, we could get this in your backyard and we could knock this down right away. And, and so we get it in his backyard and then I realize he's 13, what would he love to do? drive this thing. So now I'm teaching a 13-year-old to drive with a clutch for the first time using my lawnmower. <laughs> it was painful. <laughs> what I learned that morning is that a John Deere can do a wheel stand. Do you know that? <laughs> if you crank the throttle up high enough and you pop the clutch quickly enough, you can get the wheels off the ground. And he did several times. And I don't think I saved him any time. He was done in about a half hour. But an hour later, I look over and he's doing figure eights and just driving around. He just wanted to drive. So he brings my lawnmower back. He said, I want to pay you back. I said, well, what'd you have in mind? He said, I'll mow your yard. I said, I just mowed my yard. You don't need to do that. He said, what do you do for a living? And I started talking to him. He said, well, do you have a website? I said, no. I said, no. He said, how come? I said, because I'm technologically challenged. He said, I could build you one. He said, let me see your computer set up. My office is in my home. So I bring him and he starts looking around. He said, man, this stuff's really old. <laughs> you need new equipment. And I said, what would you suggest? He said, well, tell me how you use your computer. So I'm, I'm describing to a 13-year-old how I use my computer. He doesn't say much, he just listens. He goes home and he comes back two days later and he's printed out in hard copy both a laptop and a desktop system for me. 
So I thought, you know what, I was going to upgrade anyway. Why not now? So I call the computer store. I have Brian standing in my office. I have Julie from the computer store on speakerphone. And, and I'm asking questions like, what's your return policy? That's my level of sophistication, OK? <laughs> and, and Brian, on the other hand, is asking questions like, what's the bus on this computer? She didn't know what he was asking either. She said, let me put you on hold for a second. I said, Brian, what's a bus? He said, I got you this really fast processor. It has to go through a highway to get up to your screen. If you've got a narrow bus and a, and a fast processor, you're paying for speed. You're not getting it all. She comes back on with numbers that meant absolutely nothing to me, and Brian goes, that's good. <laughs> he coached me through the whole process. When we got done, I said, Julie, how old do you think my computer consultant is? She said, he's a 20-something techie from Microsoft, I can tell. And I have this 13-year-old just beaming in the corner of my office. I said, no, he's 13. He's my neighbor. <laughs> but he is my consultant, OK? And you know, if you could have seen Brian when I first met him, he was this overweight kid who spent most of his time in front of a computer. I'm an avid cyclist. That summer, Brian went on an outward bound experience, and he lost some weight, was feeling good about himself. And he came back, and I said, hey, Brian, if you want to keep this going, we could ride together. So we began riding together. Brian now has his own road bike. It's nicer than my road bike. He paid for it with his computer consulting money. Yeah, I'm paying him. But you know what? <laughs> None of this would have happened had I not spent five minutes over the back fence finding out what an incredible young man I have living next door. If you think this is about someone else, that you know, it's really easy to talk about what everybody else needs to do. If we're trying to create an, a movement here in Tacoma, the movement starts with you. So I want to encourage you to be just a little more deliberate and intentional in our interaction, uh, interactions with children and look at each of them as an asset building opportunity um, and don't let it pass, all right? Thank you.